Hi, everyone. Welcome again to the fourth and final workshop for the housing element. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to have you here and to have this conversation. It looks like we have a lot of participation and that is uh, that is great. Um, it means that we may have more, more uh, participants than table hosts, which is okay. Um, you may need to self-designate a table uh, leader. And don't worry, we'll go through the exercise and demonstrate how to do it. Um, and, and we'll have also a floater jumping around to help out. So uh, we will go ahead and get started. So um, I'm gonna introduce Ben Morrison, who's our uh, tech support for this evening. Just very quickly gonna go over how to use Remo, uh, make sure everyone's comfortable, let you know who he is so that you can contact him if you're having trouble. And then I'll bring on Pierre Lee from the General Plan Advisory Committee to give a brief hello. Thanks, Sarah. So I'm going to be really brief with this um, because you're all already at tables. Um, so once we close this presentation down, you know, you're at your table. That's a small group discussion, um, like a video chat, basically. And I saw some of you didn't have your cameras and your mics on. So when we go back to the tables, you'll want to click cam off and mic off. They are two buttons at the bottom of the screen. Um, Adam, if you don't hear anything, uh, you may want to try refreshing, but you may also lose your um, your place if that happens. So, um, yeah, basically, you know, stay at your table, have the discussion. Um, you can use the table chat if you're having trouble with your microphone. Um, click chat and then table chat, and you'll be able to participate in the group via chat. Um, and if you do have any tech questions, I'll post once again my email and phone number in the chat. Um, and we can just kind of handle those one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And as Diana said, you can refresh your browser um, and try to not use Safari. Safari particularly, probably not work. And additionally, if you're using an iPad, you're probably gonna have trouble with that. Um, mobile phones actually do work well, as do laptops and desktops. So uh, that's all the tech stuff for now, but happy to help out with any issues individually. Thanks, Ben. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and place his uh, information in the chat. And then I'm inviting uh, Chair Lee onto the stage um, to give a little brief overview about um, what the General Plan Advisory Committee is uh, and what we're doing. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. This is our last workshop session and the one that I've been looking forward to will actually become planners and start to evaluate real sites around Lafayette for um, for their characteristics and whether or not they can be <laughs> included um, in, as an opportunity site. So um, the GPAC is a committee of 11 uh, voting members. Uh, we have representatives from neighborhoods and commissions, um, the mayor and, um, uh, I'm sorry, the mayor and the planning commission also uh, have non-voting seats. We meet twice a month. I invite you to uh, watch our meetings. I hope that sometime later on this year, we'll be able to meet in person. It looks more and more possible. Um, and please check out our uh, website for catching your ideas, suggestions, complaints, etc. It's called Engagement HQ. We want to hear from you. Um, and it's at love, I'm sorry, planlafayette.org. So um, have fun, and um, we'll, we'll talk later. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm going to bring Renata Robles on stage, and she's going to share her screen while I uh, kind of walk through a little bit about what we're doing tonight and, um, and also uh, how to. So as I mentioned, welcome to the fourth and final workshop. Um, we are we are very glad to see that there are 114 participants right now. This is excellent. Um, okay, next slide, please. We're going to just talk about how we got here, what today's topic is, what we hope to accomplish, what that process looks like, and what comes next. Before we get started, just want to outline that we do have a lot of resources. Maybe this is the first time you're joining us, um, just starting the conversation. We do have a lot of resources already established um, to help bring you up to speed. So please visit planlafayette.org. That's our general plan website. There's lots of information about the housing element specifically. You can use the get involved uh, function uh, to find out about meetings like these as well as the GPAC meetings and also the library section 
uh, for additional information and background information. <clears throat> Engagement HQ is our, is our um, digital engagement platform. You can always email us at gen generalplan at lovelafayette.org. Uh, and then the city's main website, which is lovelafayette.org. And then, of course, planning staff is always here as a resource as well. So we have uh, previously been, uh, we've sort of done an informational phase of our outreach and engagement, um, and now we're transitioning to the public input phase. So for the informational phase, we've um, held several public meetings, including six um, specific sessions on Housing 101. We have a very interesting and clear video that's available on the website, so if you missed it, please uh, check it out. Uh, it'll give you some background information about um, what, we're, what we're talking about. We also did the uh, walking tour, which is a video you can watch, or you can also take it yourself um, to kind of identify and find out what density looks like in the downtown, different housing developments uh, in, that already exist. Um, as I mentioned, the planlafayette.org website has um, lots of information about housing, um, and background information. And then also uh, this evening, we are at our sort of Remo tables, um, which you can't see right now, but we'll get back to them in just a minute to go over the activities. Um, and we still are in this engagement process and input process. So this is not the first or last time you'll be able to engage with us. Um, we definitely want to receive all of the input that we can. So uh, stay tuned. Next slide, please. This is a very public process, and there are a lot of different factors that go into the, the uh, recommendation that the General Plan Advisory Committee will be making to the Planning Commission and City Council. They have to consider things such as the state law, the requirements that we're, requi that we're obligated to, um, to comply with, the public input, which is sort of the process that we're in now, uh, as well as background information, and of course the environmental analysis. All of those things will go into the mix uh, as the General Plan Advisory Committee uh, discusses the matter and provides a recommendation to the two uh, hearing bodies. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so you should have seen, should have received this flyer in the mail, which outlines the four series workshop. Um, as I mentioned, we are in the last, uh, we are in the last workshop this evening, um, and we're excited to get down to the details. Next slide. So again, the workshop series has been sort of broad uh, to narrow. So we initially talked about um, sort of the big picture values around housing, and then we kind of did an uh, uh, understanding the issue, kind of identifying what the issue actually is. Did some solution generation at our last workshop with the Balancing Act uh, software to identify where density can go. And then tonight we're going to be talking about specific opportunity sites and site identification. And I would like to point out that all of these activities are available online. We, uh, if you were not able to attend the session, you're able to watch the video as well as participate in the actual activity. Next slide, please. So what exactly is an opportunity site? Uh, so we're talking about housing here. And as you know, the state requires uh, 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 specific locations where new housing uh, development could occur. So these are individual parcels where new development could occur. We're planning for housing here, we're not building housing. So this is uh, a requirement for, from the state to this to all California cities to understand um, and plan for where housing could go. Um, and I, we wanna kind of point out too, we're gonna go over a few of the criteria this evening to give you a sense of what we need to look at when we find opportunity sites. Um, but just wanted to point out that there is a, an entire list of uh, state criteria, which is quite significant. Um, and so all of the sites that we find this evening will, will be vetted through, through those full criteria. Next slide, please. So it, at your tables, uh, we're kind of going through the introductory uh, items right now. Um, we'll, we'll do an activity example so that we'll teach you how to find the information and possibly identify activities, or sorry, uh, opportunity sites. And then we'll go into our tables and uh, your table host or table leader, designated table leader will uh, identify, will help you go through the activity itself. So it's gonna be a step-by-step -step process. It'll ask you a series of seven questions um, and many of them are yes and no questions. Um, and so you'll want to um, just be able to answer those questions to identify whether or not it could be considered an opportunity site. At the end, we'll report back um, and hopefully um, we'll place a pin in a map on our Engagement HQ website. 
which will um, be available to the public for three weeks after this meeting so that anyone can pick a site, uh, go through the process of identifying whether or not it's a, it should be a site we consider, add it to the map, and then uh, staff will go ahead and evaluate each and every one of those sites and bring it back to the General Plan Advisory Committee. There will be a little bit of post-event socializing this evening. Uh, assuming we have time, the meeting will end quite abruptly at 9.15, but we'll try and uh, wrap up and give a little bit of time so you can double click on a different table and talk with your friends and neighbors. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there is this activity sheet. I placed the link in the chat. It's on our website as well. Uh, and your table host will have it. Uh, it's essentially all of the blue lines at the top right corner are gonna be the questions. And the, and the right hand side, there's a tools section which give you links to the tools that you might need in order to use uh, to answer the question. And then there's a worksheet so you can fill it out. Um, so you're gonna select a property to evaluate. Uh, an address, any address in the city, uh, and then you'll go ahead and use the worksheet to assess whether or not it could be considered an opportunity site. Some of them will kick it out right away uh, based on size or whether or not there's residential on it. We'll get into that in just a minute. Um, go ahead and identify as many sites as possible. You may or may not get through one or two this evening just because it's new and you're learning how to do it, um, but feel free to use the activity after uh, this evening's meeting on, on the website. And then we'll do that report out, as I mentioned, um, and all of those sites identified will be uh, evaluated against the full criteria. Next slide. So after, as I mentioned, after the meeting, um, these uh, these sites will be, well, during the report out, these sites will be posted as a pin on a map in Engagement HQ. We'll also be demonstrating sort of how to do that so that you can do it yourselves as well once you identify different sites. Um, and again, those will be exported uh, and evaluated against the full criteria um, that the state has uh, provided. And then those evaluations will be provided to the General Plan Advisory Committee at its June 15th meeting. So any public, um, any public input or any public identified site will be evaluated and presented at June, on June 15th. So things that we want to remember this evening, we're working together as a group. Um, we want to uh, try and identify sort of our commonalities. If there's things that we disagree on, that's okay. Um, but maybe try and find those underlying commonalities. So uh, these tools are publicly available after the workshop. This isn't the, the last time that you'll be able to use them. Uh, again, think big picture. We oftentimes want to get into the details uh, a little too soon before, um, before we've kind of dealt with the big picture. So try and keep your thinking high level and, um, and and we'll get through it. Um, it's an iterative process and we may need to adjust, right? So just because one of the pin, you know, someone has identified a site um, doesn't necessarily mean it will end up in the final product. Um, and, and so we'll have to, again, evaluate it against all of the criteria, um, but we wanna get as much information and as many ideas as possible. Again, not the first or last opportunity to participate. Um, there's lots and lots of opportunities already on the website and there will be more uh, to come, so stay tuned. As we're, as we're working in groups, again, make sure that you share the airtime, um, be kind to your neighbors and make sure that if, you know, maybe if someone's not speaking up, you can ask them a question. Uh, listen to understand, as I mentioned, we're not always gonna agree on things, um, but we, we can understand where someone's coming from and, and make sure that they feel heard. Uh, and then honor the time limits so that we can, can get through at least one opportunity site. And then again, the technical assistance, um, you can double click in the upper left hand corner of the, of the screen and that's where staff will be for question and answer. You can also use the chat function or the Q&A function on the upper right hand side of your screen. If you don't see a chat bar, uh, there should be a chat icon um, that you can click on which should uh, uh, bring it up. Again, tech support is Ben Morrison. There's his email and his phone number which has been placed in the chat so you are uh, able to contact him if you need assistance. Okay, uh, and let's get the conversation started. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, go ahead and go through uh, the first exercise. So it's listed as activity one on the activity sheet. 
And we're just going to go through it um, quickly, but we'll again be available for questions. Also, our housing consultant, Diana Elrod, will be available jumping around from table to table to answer questions um, if, you have, if you have them. So in our first activity, we're going to practice with uh, 3434 Mount Seattle Boulevard. Um, and there's also a list of uh, resources at the beginning of the, of, the, of the activity sheet. You may or may not need all of them, but they're there for use if you desire. So we'll go to uh, just question one, which is what is the size of the site in acres? And so as you can see on the right hand side, there is a, uh, a tool section called, uh, well, it's a tool section. In this case, it just has community view, which tells you sort of how to use that um, specifically. There are other tools in other sections, which you may, may or may not need all of them. So you can click on that link and it'll take you to community view. Uh, which is the online mapping tool that has been on the city's available on the city's website for some time. Uh, you can use it like Google Maps. You can type it in the search bar, or you can use it uh, by scrolling using your mouse. So you'll type in the address, and then it should populate with your um, with the parcel and the address, and then it will come up with a balloon icon. And Renata is trying to um, show us how this works. It's just running a little slow, but It'll show up with a balloon icon that gives you some information about that parcel specifically. And it will tell you things like the parcel number, the address, the zoning, the size, uh, whether or not it's in a high fire hazard severity zone area or the hillside overlay district. Um, so in this case, we can see that the lot size is one acre. So we'll go ahead and answer that it's one acre. And is the site between 0.5 and 10 acres? And the answer is yes. So just below it, it says, if yes, proceed to step two. So we're going to look at the second question, which is, is the site vacant? And this really means, is the site undeveloped? And we want to ask this question. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't tell you why we asked the first question. So we're asking that first question about size, because if it's, the site is too small, it's not likely to be developed with housing, right? There's not a, a return uh, on investment for a developer to, to do that. Um, and so it needs to be a certain size to be considered. There are exceptions, which are outlined in the kind of the um, small print on the underneath the, the question. So like if it can be consolidated with just adjacent lots, or if there's some other reason why we might think it could be developed. Um, but generally speaking, if it's too small, it's likely not a candidate. The next question is, is the site vacant? Meaning is it undeveloped? Does it have no structures on it? Um, there's a list of items here that uh, indicate whether or not it would be considered vacant. So if you have a question about that, there's some additional detail there. In this case, we can see from the uh, from the Gov Clarity map or Google map um, that it is in fact developed. There is a building on the site. You might also know that from your just personal experience of the city. Um, if it's vacant, it's a little bit easier to develop, right? There's not a lot of constraints. We know there's no um, there's no residents on it or other things that might constrain it for development. So that's sort of why we're asking. Okay, so we're gonna site one, is it vacant? Nope. And so uh, if no, proceed to step three. So we'll go ahead and go to question three. And we're gonna say, are there, ask if there are existing residential uses on the site. And the reason we're asking about this is because of displacement and replacement. So there's a requirement for, um, that the housing not displace existing housing units. So if there's existing housing on the site, it's less likely to be redeveloped. So in this case, we know it's not there's not housing uh, because we know that it's a commercial site. And we know that from our knowledge of the city that it used to be the Butler County Dodge site. Um, and we could also look at Street View if that might be, if we might not know specifically. Um, to see you know, what type of uses using signage or other indicators to identify whether or not there is a residential uh, on the property. Okay, and then, so we'll say no, and then um, we'll move on to the uh, number four, which is, is, if the site is not vacant, then describe the existing use. Is there a functioning use on the site? And so again, this is going to be a little bit more of a judgment call, right? You're not you know, going to know exactly. There's not really a right answer here. It's more about um, your sense of the site and understanding whether or not there's feasibility in redevelopment of it. Um, so if there's a use on it that's functioning, that lots of people love, um, 
it's probably not going to be redeveloped in the next eight years, in the eight year cycle that is the housing element. So, um, and none of these are necessarily going to eliminate a site from being on the list for an opportunity site, but it's just something that is required to be evaluated to determine the likelihood. So we just go through and ask, uh, is there an existing building on the site? Yes, there is. Um, what is the condition of the building? Again, we can use our tools section to look at Google Street View um, to identify kind of that, uh, whether or not it's a poor condition, fair condition, hazardous condition, et cetera. Um, we're gonna select a category. In this case, we know it's commercial. Um, and then whether or not there's an active business there. Again, you can use uh, Google Street View, your knowledge of the city, um, to understand whether or not there's an active business. And then just describing what, what type of business is there. And then is the property for sale is, a, is an additional question. Um, that's gonna be found um, on LoopNet, which is a commercial or multifamily property listings. Um, there's a section for both for sale and lease, for lease. Uh, so you would just type in the address and I and see whether or not it pops up if it's uh, if it's for sale or not. You might also know just offhand, you know, oh that building's been for sale for a really long time, or there's always a for lease sign up on that particular building. So these are some of the tools that you might uh, use while determining. And then is the property for lease or for rent? So you can check those again on LoopNet, Zillow, Redfin. Um, just identifying yes or no. Um, so then we will move to the number five, which is, um, are there any topographical or environmental constraints that would limit the, the development of housing? So uh, we've listed on the right-hand side under tools, the service area for East Bay Mud, Central Sanitary District, and PG&E. Pretty much all of the city, uh, incorporated city limits is, is going to be, uh, able to, to have access to utilities. So your question and most, if you, if you choose a site in the city, it's going to be, um, your answer is going to be yes here. So there may not be actual um, utilities hooked up to that particular site, for instance, if it's vacant. However, um, there will be access. So then we'll uh, look at step 5B, which relates more to the, uh, to the environmental constraints. So these are things like, um, fire hazard zones, earthquake zones, uh, flood zones, et cetera. So this also is going to be uh, useful to look at community view because there are uh, your major three are gonna be in there. So you'll it'll say whether or not you have, it's in the hillside, if it's in the high fire hazard severity zone, if it's in the FEMA flood zone. So those might be environmental constraints. Some others might be, you know, is it steeply sloped or is there a creek on the property that might prevent some of it from being developed? Again, it's not gonna necessarily preclude it from being developed or used as an opportunity site, but we just wanna evaluate you know, what the potential is for the number of units that might be accommodated here. And then as we're looking through, if there are environmental constraints, we would wanna just maybe think about what the possible mitigations for those would be, um, if, if it's possible to mitigate them, uh, how. And then we would look at our, Next question, which is what is over is the overall development potential? So it's sort of looking back at all of the things that we just looked at and kind of giving our best guess about, you know, is this actually something that might be developed? Um, and there may be something that you know about the site that just, you know, it gives you a sense that it's not going to be developed in the next eight years. So some of the questions are, does the existing use uh, constitute an impediment to additional residential development? Again, for example, if it's a fully leased apartment building, it's probably not going to get demolished and rebuilt with a new apartment building. What's the current market demand for the existing use? So again, you kind of have to just use your best guess. For instance, where a lot of us are working from home now, so that has an effect on the demand for office space. So that's gonna, those market factors are gonna play play a role in whether or not a site might be developed. Are there any known leases or other contracts uh, that would prevent redevelopment of the, of the site in the next eight years? Um, this, again, is sort of best guess. Um, examples of, of, else, of elsewhere 
vacancy. Are there examples elsewhere of this kind of use being redeveloped for housing? So again, that office example is, uh, is a common one. Office buildings have been demolished for residential, so that would play into your considerations. Are market conditions ripe for redevelopment for the housing site? And uh, given the high land value in Lafayette, this is probably a general yes, um, but again, sort of use your judgment. So then again, using uh, all of what you described, is the, what is the, how feasible is it or likely is it uh, to be redeveloped? So we'll just go with high, medium, low. <clears throat> and then you can just make some comments about why you think that. Um, and again, there's no right or wrong answer here. Every site that gets selected will be, uh, we can list and we can review it um, to see whether or not it could be accommodated. So this is sort of just, again, scratching the surface of what, um, what is required from the state. Uh, and there are additional set of requirements, but this gives you a sense of what, uh, what we're looking at and if something could be potentially considered an opportunity site. And then the very last question is actually uh, a community question. So it's, are there any additional community criteria that we'd like to add in addition to what's required from the state? So in the example, uh, it should sort of ideally be a yes or no question so that it's more empirical. Can, you know, does looking at a site, does it comply with this yes or no, which puts it out or in? Um, that's a little bit easier to, to process. But um, so as the example was, you know, is it directly next to, is it multifamily directly next to single family residential? And sometimes those can be incompatible based on height or other factors. And so that may be a consideration that the community wants to consider or, or some other. So anything else uh, is sort of this catch-all section here. Keeping in mind that if we do add additional criteria that may uh, reduce the number of sites that we could find, uh, in which case it may, need, it may require additional density in other areas. So that is the example. And now we're gonna set you loose with your tables and table hosts uh, to run through uh, a site on your own. Again, you can pick any site in the city. You might have a reason for choosing one over the other. Um, go ahead and introduce yourselves first to your tables. Um, and again, if you don't have a table host, um, feel free to designate one, but we'll go ahead and jump around and try and find everybody a spot. Okay, excellent. So we'll go ahead and, um, start the clock for about 40 minutes, and then we will come back uh, and do a report out. Thanks everyone, have fun. Welcome back everyone. Hopefully you were able to uh, identify an opportunity site and work through the process. Um, so I will go ahead and uh, start to pull up the folks that were on uh, at the tables as hosts. So um, we'll bring up Chair Lee. There we go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> everyone, <laughs> an opportunity site. Um, and um, we were, um, I was just talking about how I'm gonna pull some folks up on stage to report out what they found, what the opportunity sites uh, were, and a little bit about your discussion. Um, I'll also pull up Renata on stage to share her screen to kind of demonstrate how you might go about placing a pin in the map on Engagement HQ. Um, and I'll go ahead and also just take some additional notes uh, as well. So let's see here. Renata is there, and she'll go ahead and share her screen. And we're just going to go in order here. So, um, Chair Lee, can you tell the group identified an opportunity site and uh, any kind of interesting tidbit to make the conversation? Uh, yeah. Hold on one minute. I'm just trying to get back to. There we are. Okay. Um, so we uh, we began by looking at. Um, 3366 Mount Diablo Boulevard, which ended up to be um, an apartment building. And when we went through the, the um, questions, 
if it is a, an apartment building or other residence, the, the recommendation is to consider choosing another site because why knock down an apartment building to build another apartment building? But um, I'll, I'll go into why we came back to that in, in a little bit. Um, then we looked at uh, Cresco, <laughs> a Lafayette treasure, 33880 Mount Diablo uh, Boulevard, and it was too small. Uh, then we started looking at a residence, and um, although it met the size criteria, I think most of the group was uncomfortable with actually looking at uh, a residence without having, um, because it, it is a residence, and we had said no to the Mount Diablo Boulevard apartment complex because it's also a residence, but it's a multi-unit residence or multi-family. Uh, so we went back and looked at... Um, Park Apartments again. And we actually came up with some, uh, well, my group did. They came up with some great ways to look at uh, this apartment complex. Um, it's, uh, let's see, it was built in the 60s. And there are, uh, I believe, 70, uh, 67 units, so it's very close to the 35 um, units per acre uh, downtown zoning. And we took a look at the map and realized there are vacant lots behind it on Stewart Street that could be used for either additional housing or some sort of storage or parking. Um, it's walking distance to downtown, which might make it attractive. If you're able to pull together other parcels in the area, um, you would have uh, the ability to offer possibly affordable housing if you could have higher density and more units. Um, it looks poorly laid out now because it was probably an original building that got built, built on, but that could be remodeled without actually having being knocked down. Uh, there seemed to be some vegetation in the photos at least that could be removed, but we couldn't identify whether or not they were oaks or other protected species. So we weren't able to, to make a, um, uh, uh, to really know what, what uh, was had. But I, I think this was a great opportunity to uh, find out what happens when you re-look at something in, in kind of a little more creative way. And um, that, that was, I think, the point where, you know, everybody in the group had a, had a suggestion. So I was very happy Chris, with that. Chris, what's the address? That so it was 3366? 3366 Mount Diablo Boulevard. The Park Apartments. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jim. Yeah. Um, so we, we went through a few different exercises. One was a residential parcel actually over on Pleasant Hill Road, um, and uh, which is a large parcel with a just a, a single family residence on it, just to walk through the exercise. Um, you know, there it's really up to the landowner discretion. So we thought, well, let's, we focus then on the downtown. Um, we picked uh, 3529 Mount Diablo Boulevard, which is the where the art gallery is now, it used to be a bank, um, Mont, Mont Diablo and um, Moraga. Uh, we picked it really in part because we were such admirers of the architecture there, and we thought it would be a good candidate to tear down, to replace, um, and I'm being totally tongue in cheek here. Um, so just walking through it, the, the parcel is just under a half an acre, uh, so it doesn't really help us on the affordable housing side. And then using some of the tools that we had available, we looked at the, um, uh, LoopNet uh, app with, to try to get a handle on what's the um, what's the story on the as in, with the property since it's commercial, and kind of found through that that it looks like it's part of a La Fiesta two potential development. Um, and so, given that there's an existing use, albeit not a very attractive one, uh, but it may be in play for further commercial, made us think that the probability for that site was low also given the size of the parcel. So we kind of moved away from that. Um, we walked further down Moraga Road uh, to that the vacant parcel on St. Mary's in Moraga, which I think people call the Brazoni parcel, uh, vacant. 
Um, and um, it's a, I think it's two acres. So there's potential there on, for development because you typically don't see vacant land. You know, the group talked through the issues there, traffic, safety being two key ones. Um, you know, related to, to traffic, you might have air quality. Um, and, um, you know, just the, it's just the congestion on Moraga Road. So, um, you know, we kind of viewed that as a, in, more in the, as a medium candidate, but the traffic would be a key consideration. Um, and, you know, that, uh, that was the, the, the big issue there. So um, I think in the end, we concluded that a big, you know, whereas you go through the zoning exercise, the, one of the key considerations is um, how it all gets done and the importance of design review in this process so that you have something that looks attractive at the end and fits into the community. Um, and that was sort of a, um, uh, a key part in the, in the real implementation of all this once you get past the zoning. So that was a good group. We had a great, great conversations and uh, it was helpful to understand better how the considerations work as you go through this process and try to figure out what are real opportunity sites. So thank you. Thanks, Jim. Matt. Hi, um, we also uh, talked about the um, the lot, the Brazoni lot um, that Jim just talked about, and we had it as a, a medium to high, kind of that range. The one thing we were concerned about a little bit is the um, there is a uh, flood zone there, and there would have to be some mitigating uh, uh, work to make sure that when it eventually rains, that uh, there doesn't become a flooding issue there. We did talk about the traffic issues also there. Uh, we also looked at the BART lots. Uh, we rated that as high. Um, you know, it's 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 just it's such a prime open space for um, development, uh, close to transit, uh, wouldn't be displacing anything. But uh, then you get into concerns about parking. Um, you know, we talked about whether we could do underground parking in that area or whether BART would be encouraged to have build parking structures like they do in Walnut Creek, but we rated that as high. We then switched over to the De Silva property over across from Oakwood. And uh, that was an interesting debate. Um, there was one unknown there is, are the soils strong enough to support building but in the end we felt like their soils engineers could probably figure that out it is on a hillside um you know it's a very valuable piece of land i'm sure it's people do not want it to be developed uh but it's huge uh, it's 68 acres uh, all told but we had that down as a medium potential uh, we also talked about 972 hoff uh, right in the core of downtown right behind the church uh, we rated that as medium it's not a big lot uh, but it's just a parking lot right now and uh, um, you know it's it's got good potential from a walkability standpoint and then finally we had one of our members um, who felt very passionate about a place called Franklin Lane that I had never heard of and it's actually up on Happy Valley um, and it, uh, it's off Happy Valley and near Rose Lane. It goes up towards a, a hillside. And there looks like there's four vacant lots along there. Uh, but it is all single family housing. Um, uh, the lot sizes were been up to support multifamily. Um, the only thing you got to think about would be the traffic consideration. And also the fact that that is an area that, um, you know, has, has never had multifamily housing. So it'd be a very different type of environment. And I'm sure there'd be a lot of discussions with neighbors in doing that, to be polite about it. So uh, so anyway, those were the ones that we talked about. Let's see, did I miss anything? Nope, that was it. Great, thank you. Um, and now we bring Stella on stage and Jonathan and Renata. Sorry, I took the map away. It was uh, too slow, but 
Uh, we will demonstrate at the end of our report out how to drop a pin once we have had the chance to do the activity yourself. Okay, am I up, Sarah? Go ahead. <laughs> Hello. Uh, let's see, I had a wonderful group this evening. I wanna thank my group, uh, uh, very diverse, represented a number of different areas in Lafayette and we had a wonderful discussion and thank the planning team for the tools they gave us this evening to walk through the process. Uh, our site is 3458 uh, Mount Diablo Boulevard. Uh, it's two parcels that make up that one address. Um, let's see, uh, we calculated it at uh, 0.64 acres. Um, let's see here, this is a site across the street from McDonald's. Uh, we identified it as close to the uh, upcoming corporate terraces development. So it was uh, potential housing uh, close to uh, some upcoming housing in the city as well. Um, we did discuss that uh, it was likely that parking would have to be handled underneath the site uh, because it is very constrained that it is close to that half acre limit. So uh, there may need to be some consideration on how parking was handled at the site. Uh, the existing use uh, is a, a building company. Uh, it, it's their offices and it appears from the, the map view that they uh, store some, some of the larger equipment on the large parking area on the site. Um, it is also uh, adjacent to some existing parking over there in the area that looks like it's uh, either in use or will be in use uh, with the, the corporate terraces development. So the chances to uh, expand into some of those other sites around it may be limited. Um, let's see here. I think that uh, we didn't we didn't find that there were any environmental constraints that we need to be concerned about in that area, um, and we did uh, rate it very high. I believe we had it at an eight for the potential development for that site. Thank you. Um, let's go with Stella. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm not trying to be dramatic with my setting, but PG&E turned my power off in the middle <laughs> of our of our um, our work. But fortunately, I have a UPS and it's working. But in case I drop off, let me just get through this. Um, I had a really, really good group. They're very um, enthusiastic and um, wanted to keep on going, um, but we got to about, I'd say five potential opportunity sites. Um, some of which have already been mentioned, so I won't go into them in detail, but Da Silva was one. Um, there was a vision for it as maybe a kind of um, multi-use um, housing development. So maybe different types of housing units um, in terms of buildings, building types. Um, athletic fields was something that was mentioned as a desire of parks, trails, and recreation, and that that's a, a large enough space that could accommodate maybe that integrated into the site plan. Um, that one was ranked um, as high feasibility. Um, and then the um, next one was um, really a, a set of parcels that were identified as being um, mostly vacant, looked like they had once been um, started to be developed as single family homes, but but building did not occur, did not continue. Um, and so they are completely nestled within single family um, area. And so the address is 899 Hope Lane, which does have a house on it. We were unable to determine if it's occupied, um, but it was a 1943 home um, with a very low property valuation or assessment rather. Um, and so it seems like it's probably not changed hands um, or possibly not been um, improved since then. Um, then there was a whole series of parcels next to it that are all on Broadmoor Court. Um, 869, 873, 891, 895, 896, and 900, which in total was about 10 acres. Um, these are right off of, Broadmoor Court is right off of St. Mary's Road, and um, they're just 
to the north of the trail, of the Lafayette Moraga Trail. Um, the advantages were seen as that they're adjacent, or sorry, they're near schools, near the trail, near downtown. Um, so very close to walkable downtown. Um, one of the community concerns or criteria is that it, it, they are surrounded by single family homes and the access as I'm looking at it is a pretty small court um, to St. Mary's Road. But that was ranked. Um, the group of them were all, well, the, the parcel that had a home on it was ranked as medium because we really don't know the circumstances. And then the vacant parcels were ranked as high. Um, they also identified the Brizoni lot on Moraga Road. Um, really all of the same considerations came up that um, it is adjacent to single family homes on the one side that there's the creek um, and also that the traffic and traffic volumes noise on Moraga Road was less desirable. And the, I think there's one more, sorry, I'm dark. so. I'm using my my uh, my monitor to help me out here. Um, okay, I think that was it. Except we did get in the last two minutes that we had a discussion going about Golden Gate Way. We didn't look at the specific addresses, but the idea was just that there are a number of um, commercial properties there that seem to be underutilized and could be something to look at. And that's it. Excellent. And I. Um I am just going to do a little bit of a time check. So I think uh, we have about 20 minutes left and the meeting will end pretty abruptly if we don't finish. So I just want to make sure our next speakers are a little concise so we can get through everyone and make sure it's recorded. Um, let's go with uh, uh, Beth. Beth. Oh, I'm never concise. And sorry, my dog, <laughs> my dog has to go out. So you may hear her talking in the background. Um, we went through, um, many of the same um, properties. Uh, the first one we looked at though was at the El Charo site. It's, you know, a large vacant site near transportation with a large parking lot behind it. So that's viable. I don't know if it's up for sale or not right now. And then we took a sweep outside of downtown Lafayette um, and we looked at 3255 Stanley Boulevard which is the gas station adjacent to Akalani's High School. So uh, we determined that uh, it's, a, it's a good location. We have lots of gas stations in Lafayette, so it wouldn't be a hardship to lose one right there. And there are some properties behind it as well. So that was just looking outside the box a little bit. Um, it made a lot of sense. And then there was some land behind St. Perpetua that we took a look at um, that uh, they've never developed. I don't believe it's for sale, but it looks like a nice a nice uh, piece of property. Anyway, it was fun. It was very creative. I think we could have gone on a lot longer and my group know, knew more about Lafayette than I did. So we're in good shape. Excellent. Thank you, Beth. Jonathan Fox. Uh, my group also chose uh, 3058 Mount Diablo Boulevard. It's an undersized parcel, so they thought it could be consolidated with a parcel to the north, 1005 2nd Street. Um, uh, because it's a underutilized commercial building, uh, the group noted that they haven't seen signs of life at that building for a while, so thought it could be redeveloped into higher density housing. Um, after going through the exercise, the group offered some additional community criteria. One is that um, Lafayette should ensure that opportunity sites are near amenities like grocery stores, parks, um, restaurants, uh, particularly that it's walkable to those things. And uh, also that it's in close proximity to other multifamily development. Um, another community criteria that I thought should be added is to assess whether or not the site um, can accommodate underground parking so that um, these sites, space is not taken up by um, parking at grade. Um, we only went through one site, so that's the one. Excellent, thank you. Thanks. Renata. 
So we uh, got through one site. Uh, it's 969 Akalani's Road. Uh, actually, a member of our group is the owner. Um, so it's currently a single family home with a ADU in the back, but it's over two acres in size and right by the highway. Um, so we had an interesting conversation about, you know, what would be appropriate there um, and found it could be a high, medium high um, feasibility for that site. Um, there were concerns about kind of traffic and uh, school impacts uh, in adding homes there. Um, but on the flip side, it's close to the highway, so that could be a mitigation point, less people driving through downtown. Uh, one of the community criteria is similar to Jonathan's, um, that uh, we focus the housing uh, close to BART and services. Um, but I really appreciate my group. Thank you all so much. Great, Greg Wolf. Uh, thank you. Really good group, some return folks. Good to see them again, and some new folks as well. A very good mix in conversation. We, our primary site we looked at it was 1020 Brown Avenue. Um, it's a small cottage, if you will, with an associated parking lot, two parcels that total 0.3 acres. Uh, so it is non-vacant, but it has no residential units on it. It has two businesses on site, an upholsterer and a picture framer. Um, we calculated that you could get nine market rate and two below market rate units on that, um, which is very similar to the project immediately south at the corner, uh, which is the mill at Brown Avenue. Uh, it could take a different form factor and not townhomes. It could be uh, ground floor parking with uh, stacked flats above. Um, and no real constraints to speak of. Uh, property owner would need to be wanting and willing to do it. Um, and, and it was noted about the proximity to the freeway and air quality with respect to uh, the below market rate units. Um, other sites we looked at were Safeway. Uh, it's, I think, almost a three acre site and, and more than half of it is surface parking. And so other Safeways um, have better site utilization um, with garages, parking on top. Um, so there is opportunity there. We looked at the Wells Fargo at Happy Valley and Mount Diablo Boulevard. Um, that is a one story building with a lot of parking around it. Um, and could potentially be redeveloped. We looked at the two acre vacant site at Moraga, St. Mary's and Rosedale, which has been discussed previously tonight. The old library site uh, that went to the school. So those were the ones we looked at. So thanks to my group. Thank you. Jen Wakeman. Thank you. Um, we had a great conversation, diverse perspectives at our table. Uh, Everyone was a good listener, so that was nice to see. Um, we talked about a lot of properties that have already been mentioned. We talked about the De Silva property. We talked about um, the McDonald's property. I think we already talked about that one, right? Um, the uh, lot at St. Mary's Road, Moraga Road, and Rosedale. And uh, we also, right before um, the table time concluded, we started talking about El Charo property site. Um, I think that our conclusions were, were similar to other tables, so I don't think there's anything new to add there, um, but I have notes that I'll share with all of you after. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jeff, which sites did your table choose? Oh, I'm up. Um, we had a great group, and I want to just shout out to everyone. Much appreciated. Um, there was a kind of a... a an effort to look outside the downtown area. And so the site that we kind of spent most time uh, with was 3101 Old Tunnel Road, kind of Old Tunnel Road and Leland, adjacent to the Leland Reservoir. And the fact that nobody brought it up makes me think that there's probably some glaring reason why it's completely undevelopable. But anyway, we, we did look at it. Uh, it's five acre site, it has, it's vacant. Uh, it's adjacent to the Leland Reservoir, which is owned by um, East Bay Mud, and I, apparently there are some plans in place to replace the existing reservoir. So there was some talk about how uh, that that property, plus perhaps a couple of the vacant residential single-family properties, could be bundled, even up to seven acres, and look at some type of a master plan there. 
for uh, some lower density housing, but it's a large parcel. It has good access uh, from an environmental standpoint. Uh, it's a hillside overlay, but other than that, it didn't look like there were any any major criteria. It is a hillside. There's some topographic information, topographic issues that would would have to be taken a look at. So we were we were uh, we spent a lot of time on that site, and towards the end of our of our session, we also talked a bit about the kind of the Trader Joe's property to Diablo Foods and how there was a potential there to modernize it and maybe create some mixed use development there. We know that there's about six or seven owners, very complicated situation. Um, and that's kind of where we left it. Thank you. Lisa. First of all, shout out to my group. You guys were fantastic. We were off to a slow start. And at the two minute warning, we were just getting really started. But we did cover the, the silver property, our one and only, and um, determined that it was highly, it was a high probability, feasibility um, for development. And just the one note that with a great conversation and great participation from everyone, thank you. Just one um, observation that we made with regard to the developability of it is it's keeping if the architecture and the development is more of a clustered feeling and um, different sizes of buildings um, made to preserve the, the view of the ridge lines and um, preserve the trees. Um, that was an important factor in, in the site to maintain because it's sort of a gateway to the city. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, Samina. Hello. So our group identified two sites that we uh, did a detailed review about. The first one was uh, 3939 Mount Diablo Boulevard. Um, currently, the site is vacant and has been considered for a cancer center. But our group uh, identified some uh, potential uh, mitigations or like what does the site has to offer for housing. So it is walkable, it has, uh, it can accommodate the new traffic uh, demands for the trip that would be generated with the, uh, it can be a uh, um, medium to high uh, density uh, housing unit since uh, it will not, the height wouldn't impede any views. And then also it would uh, blend well in the surrounding uh, because there are already residential uh, parcels uh, around that property. Uh, other than that, uh, our um, group also identified the parcel that has uh, the El Jaro uh, Mexican cafe. It looks like that, uh, but that parcel was small and then meet the criteria for uh, 0.5 acres. Uh, our group suggested that there are many crummy old buildings al along that line that can be clubbed together uh, and be dedicated as an as, to a housing development. Uh, the second site that we discussed was um, uh, 3396 Mount Diablo Bolivar. Uh, uh, this site has multiple buildings, like at least three to say, and one of them, the, the constraint of this site is there actually no environmental constraints, but that that parcel has one of the two animal hospitals, hospital buildings, and then there is another the the building that specifically our group was talking about is on the corner, and that building is currently uh, office space building. Uh, we identify that there are uh, very, <clears throat> and, uh, everything is, uh, nothing is vacant uh, uh, and no offices are available for lease. So we thought that this would be like a low to medium feasible in terms of the ranking uh, because it is used for financial services, um, uh, animal uh, hospital services and other, uh, text preparation services. So that, that's what we had. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, so it might sound like a broken record, but like A and Jonathan, we also came up with 3458 Mount Diablo and 1005 Second Street. Originally, um, the table had thought of the, the site right next to the building at the corner. 
thinking that it was owned by the same owner, but it's not actually that vacant lot. It's actually owned by Miramar. Um, so it's being currently in the process of being developed or it received its entitlement to be developed. Um, but we did find out that 1005 Second Street was owned by the same owner. Um, and everyone thought it was a, an eyesore blighted property that had this nondescript, had no signs, didn't look like it had any life, but was um, surprised that it was actually being used by um, a contractor. Um, so it looks like it's a home base for a construction company. Um, they think this is a great location for residential um, and that um, it would be highly desirable just because of its location, proximity to BART, um, and that they could likely, with the pro probably with the price, they could be relocated elsewhere um, since it seems to be um, not a place where people would walk into. Excellent. Thank you. And then we had two tables that sort of hosted themselves. So um, Brian Alcorn or David Clark, do you want to uh, report out from your table? And then we'll pull up uh, either Don Eames or um, There's David. It's smart of you to bring me in at the end. We only got five minutes left, so I can only take up that much. No, hurry, hurry. We, our group, we had a good group. And Brian's an architect, but he didn't reveal that until halfway in. So we wound up with some great answers. But we looked at two properties. The first was the eastern, uh, the eastern bar parking lot. And uh, we looked at that and decided that it would be great for housing. And obviously, the, the issue, the, the, the creativity here was only looking at the eastern lot. Uh, the, we investigated that on the theory that the, part, the current parking uh, lots, the two to the west, were still required um, and that they served a function that we didn't want to interrupt. So that we could put high-density housing on the, on the eastern lot. We talked a little bit about uh, it is in a fire it's a, a, a fire danger zone. We talked a little bit about mitigation for that as it's close to 24. And then Brian pointed out a number of uh, construction materials and processes that we uh, could recommend to uh, hopefully mitigate a potential fire fire hazard. We also looked, uh, I know we're running out of time here. So we also looked at La Fiesta Square, which one of our members enthusiastically informed us is for sale. So we uh, looked at that the parcel on the uh, GIS map. It's a very strangely shaped parcel. Um, if you take a look at it, it's got appendages, uh, but it's uh, we it's it's currently um, um, commercial, as you know. But just looking at that GIS map, about half the about fifty percent of the parcel is parking, and it seems like it probably could be better configured. Uh, we we thought it would continue to be a good source for. Uh, mixed uh, mixed use development, and I, of course, given no no possible bias, pointed out that the back of that parcel fronts on the on the creek, if you will, and um, therefore there's a potential for a creekside development along that. It, it's really a critical parcel. I didn't realize that was the parcel that went to the creek, but so there it seems to be there there could be multiple uses in in um, um, utilizing that lot, and those were the two that we looked at as a group. Excellent. And then uh, Don is the last one, although I think they had nominated someone else, but I can't find that person quite uh, quite yet. Don, I think you are on stage if you want to unmute yourself and, and uh, turn on your mic. And you can either give me the name of the person or, uh, or speak. It was Daniel. Uh, Daniel. Daniel Horowitz. But our group could not identify any sites because we felt that the city should hopefully ask individual property owners throughout the city to offer up if they wanted to provide additional housing on their property or up zone or ADUs um, by postcard to contact everybody in the city since it affects everybody and to legally challenge the RENA numbers with 
to get with other cities and organizations to do so and keep Lafayette's the housing. And Daniel may want to add something to this. I'm just going to say that the meeting will pretty much end in about a minute. So you can use that minute. Um, but it's, I'm not cutting you off. It's the meeting is just right. Ending. Yeah, that's fine. No, Daniel. We were concerned with the quality of life. You know, Greg Wolf's idea is finding spots of development, and that's brilliant and great. But the number of units we have to add will never, um, we won't find that many brilliant ideas. So we were thinking about finding large parcels of land like um, Matt Peace talked about and building a really nice place for people to live with parks and transportation. If we're going to get less affluent people into our community, let's give them a nice, beautiful place to live instead of sticking them here and there. A bad, congested place. Let's put a little more money in and a little more time and make it really nice for them, be more welcoming. So that's what our group talked about. Thank you, everyone, very, very much. Please, please, please visit uh, Love Lafayette or planlafayette.org um, and sign up for all of our GPAC meetings.